You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for January 18th, 2019. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where you bet your ass we've given up flying commercial, it's the professional left with Trip Glass and Blue Gal. Many moons ago, we yeah. gave up flying commercial just yeah. because it's a pain in the ass. And we don't. We don't, literally, yeah. Your legs and my butt do not fit in airplane seats. So. No, no, no. They're trying to kill us, Blue Gal. They're trying to keep us here. They're so. trying to. We enjoy really the uh, fit us in a sardine can. So it 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 is a uh, you know no need to repeat uh, sort of my traveling woes, but I am very tall. I'm a head taller than normal, and it is mm-hmm. cripplingly unpleasant to fly anything other than and and you put you know you buy your way to the first few uh, the first cohort, and then you make a dive for an aisle seat or something. But it, that's just no yeah. way to travel. Exit row seat if you can get it, but even yeah. then you're you're pushed in. I mean yeah. you're six foot eight, so it's. Yeah tough and i have to say there has been a revolution in uh body size awareness to (laughs) the point where my daughters now you know i've always felt that you know i'm kind of have a uh, breeder body a hippie i'm i'm wide in the hips and uh now my daughters thanks to the rap revolution thank me for allowing them to inherit my booty (laughs) so (laughs) 20 years ago, that would not have been the case. But now it's, Mom, thank God you have a booty, because without that, we wouldn't be thick, is what they say. So, um... And you you ask, you don't want to look like a starved uh, uh, anorexic heroin addict? Right. Because that was... (laughs) That was the uh, thing. And they looked at you like, what? Why? Who? What? Yeah. That's that's Walking Dead stuff, no, Mom. There was, there was a time when when models on the runway actually wore makeup to look that way. Heroin, yeah. heroin chic. Heroin, heroin chic. chic. Yeah, was a thing. Yeah. yeah. And we're not making fun of anyone no, with, an eating with a disorder. with a condition. FYI, right. my brother works and worked as a chef for a high-end place that handles eating disorders, right. and we do take those sorts of things seriously. Right. But to turn starving yourself and looking like a junkie into a fashion the statement? <laughs> female, the female ideal yeah. was horrifying. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm not sure how we segue from there to well, here. I think we ought to start right in with our sponsor this week. Yeah, yes, our good old and and we're we're not going to do against over my objections. I thought we should do another retrospective show. <laughs> he wanted to uh, do another forty five <laughs> screen, you know, the, the, Google Doc of fifty four pages and just read yeah. it. And I said, the bal- no, there's too much news this week. We really have to. Yeah, we I know. have to get back to that. What? And I, I'm just kidding. We didn't. I I wasn't serious about that, but it was fascinating to see sort of take a week off and just do a big picture sweep of the news for the last decade mm-hmm. and come back and it's just oh my god it really is a fire hose yep. there just isn't any way to sort of encompass it all so you have to look for the the larger perspective and that's why we'd like to thank our our highest paying and most prolific and most uh uh enduring sponsor where the good lord split you emergency farewell party supplies where this week the offer code is shut down for what yeah yeah, because eight hundred thousand people are sitting home with nothing to do. Uh, people who should be attending to our courts and our coastlines and watch, making sure our skies are safe and making sure that things are inspected that go into our bodies and go into our yards and go into our cars and making sure that papers get processed for businesses and taxes get paid. All the people, all the civil servants who labor so nobly and uh, in in quiet. And here's the thing: I blame the shutdown on Reagan. Yeah, I I see your point with that actually. Uh-huh. Yeah, because Reagan Reagan decided he needed a group of people domestically who it was okay to just shit all over mm-hmm. and who couldn't really object. And Reagan began. Everyone bitches about the government. Even when I worked for the government, I bitched about the government. But it wasn't like they were a hostile invading force that I needed to go in my basement with a year's worth of food and guns to protect myself against. Right. It was like oh, the DMV is a fucking hassle. And the post office, you wait forever. Well, our post office is actually really great. The DMV here works very smoothly, so thanks to both of them. But making government workers a hated and despised 
filthy minority who will steal from you, who will knife you in the back, who are lazy and stupid and don't care about this country. That's Ronald Making Reagan. that rhetoric safe. Yep. It was Ronald Reagan. That started and, Ronald and firing Reagan. the PACO union as well. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and so, 30 years of no strikes out there. For, you know, that's now changing. We're getting back to striking and particularly yeah. shout out to the High teacher time. strike in, in Los Angeles. LA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. High time. We're, yeah. We're getting back to that. But it took decades because Don, because Ronald Reagan fired the air traffic controllers who were on strike. He just fired them all and he punished mm-hmm. them beyond firing by preventing them from being rehired. And that mm-hmm. killed the strike as a labor union tool for decades. And it made it made it, it sent the signal to to uh, management everywhere yep. that you can just do whatever the fuck you right. want with unions, right. and we're not gonna we're not gonna we're gonna look the other way. Go go to town. And Ronald Reagan made it safe to beat up on my mom, yeah, who was yeah. a school teacher right. for forty right. years. Um, and unacceptable, unacceptable. Most public servants are decent, honest citizens, just like you and me, who went into public service largely for the right reason. And just want to do a good job and go home. And and people who've been raised on Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and Ann Coulter telling them the government's evil, government's awful, government workers are, are thieves and liars. Fuck the government. It's too big anyway. Let's drown it in a fucking bathtub. This is what happens. Because, okay, let's try. Let's try shutting the federal government down for a month. See what happens. Oh, you mean the air <laughs> air travel isn't safe anymore? You mean actual Republican lawmakers are now sort of on the down low begging the TSA to go on strike so they can be air quote forced to do their goddamn job. Remember tomorrow, Mitch McConnell right now, even as we're recording this podcast on Friday, Mitch McConnell could bring funding bills to the floor of the Senate and open the government by nine o'clock tomorrow morning. It's all he has to do. He just has to, Mitch McConnell has to do his job, but it's now become such an accepted fact of, of, of natural law just part of the background, part of the ecology of Washington, that Mitch McConnell is a monster. Republicans are irresponsible, reckless vandals. That reporters don't even ask that question anymore. They don't even ask why are Republicans behaving like thugs and barbarians, because that's just who they are. It's like having the the abusive, insane spouse and and the nice mom. You you After a while, you know not to go to dad for anything, because dad's just going to yell at you and, and wail on you. And you have to go to the nice parent. Because the nice parent's the only one you can trust. At this point, reporters know that everything depends on Nancy Pelosi. Everything depends. On, and this, I got to give Democrats credit for this. Mm-hmm. I thought they'd fold. I re, and, and nothing against Nancy Pelosi or, or any, but every Democrat I've seen on television has been remarkably disciplined in their message. And clear and calm. So this is Mitch McConnell's problem. Where's Mitch? What's going on with Mitch? Why why, why don't you ask Mitch McConnell? Why don't you ask Donald Trump? We offer them everything they wanted. They told us to go fuck off. All right, fine. That's that's the way they want it. But they could open up the government tomorrow. And they've all been very disciplined and very clear. And I got to give them credit. Um, I don't think I, someone said this. It wasn't me. Um, <laughs> Donald Trump set a trap for Nancy Pelosi. Then he walked into it. Then she shut the door and locked it behind him. And so we're going to start by talking about uh, the cattle prod. That uh, someone yeah. in the upstairs suites of CNN <laughs> grabbed and walked yes. through the building, uh, letting apparently all of the on-air talent know that you'd better both cider us this shit or you're fired. Because what clearly happened, right. and, and actually Stephanie Rule over at MSNBC is now doing the same thing, of when are the Democrats going to realize that we can't go on like this forever? The deal is sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk. She's passed the bills. We're waiting for Senate approval. They've done their job. The House has done their job. Mm -hmm. And it's up to Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump. This is where the ball has landed. And yet Chris Cuomo, who is getting hell for it on Twitter, keeps saying, well, Mm -hmm. you can't go on like this forever. Nancy's got to do something. And you had Mm -hmm. some really good... uh, pillow talk about this this morning <laughs> uh just well yes, we're, we're just mentioning time. how the um yeah responsibility the responsible party and i don't mean that in terms uh-huh. of blame i mean that in terms of the maturity issue the mature uh uh-huh. responsible party the democrats seems to be continually asked to 
yield another yard on the playing field over and right. over again. Right. Just David mm-hmm. Brooks, just give them what they want. Just give them, give them $5 billion. Just, just for God's sakes, just give them what they want. And let's get on with, no, let's not. Let's not. Let's try something else. Because that hasn't worked for 30 fucking years. That's why we're here. That's why we have this problem. Because assholes like David Brooks and the rest of the Beltway media have always said, look, Democrats, you have to give in because these guys are fucking nuts. That's not the way you negotiate anymore. We're not negotiating that way anymore. What we're asking now is, why isn't your coverage? Why isn't the leading your story? Mitch Mm -hmm. McConnell is a bitch. Mitch McConnell is Donald Trump's footstool. Mitch McConnell refuses to do his goddamn job. Mitch McConnell won't even bring to the floor stuff they've already voted on. They've already approved of. He knows he has 100 votes for, for anything he brings to the floor, and he won't do it. This is Mitch McConnell. Why don't you go to his house? Why don't you stand out in front of his house? Why don't you find him in a restaurant and yell at him like actual citizens do when they're angry at their government for screwing them? Why don't you just do your goddamn job and report on the fact in our local paper today, the cartoon in the editorial section is a wall, which is a brick wall, and a wall, and it shows a a donkey and Donald Trump jointly holding a document saying government shutdown. Right. Because it has to be both sides. And that is the next and last battle in our long war to take our country back. We yes, have we to do. kill both siderism. It has to die this time around. People who practice it now, people who look the other way, people who shrug, people who were paid an enormous amount of money to enable the right have to be inflicted with such incredible professional agony that they stop doing it. And the thing is, I think it's working. I do, too. I see a lot of the Professional Left podcast seeping into the general air of conversation among people who may too. have listened to us before, or maybe not. But it does seem like the uh, conventional wisdom is shifting toward both siderism is bullshit. Mm-hmm. And you can just see it in Chris Cuomo's Twitter stream. The amount of pushback he's getting, mm-hmm. not just from blue check marks, but from lots and lots of people saying, Oh, come on. This is not Nancy Pelosi's responsibility, obviously. Mm-hmm. And and let's not ignore, and this is where I think also Chris Cuomo falls flat. Uh, he wants to ignore that Rush Limbaugh exists. Right. He wants to ignore that Ann Coulter is a part of this they all do. conversation. Uh, and if you are not willing to say this is the president being weak, this is mm-hmm. the so-called president of the United States being uh, pussy whipped by right. two right wing uh, no accounts, loud mouths who are in this, as you said, so brilliantly this week to me in the car. They're in the same grift that Donald Trump is. And yes, that's the problem. They're yes, after they the are. same audience. Mm-hmm. So the fight is over those MAGA dollars, those MAGA, that MAGA attention. And who's going to uh, maintain the loyalty? Well, Rush Limbaugh will be there after Donald Trump leaves office. He's mm-hmm. got, you know, the long game. Ann Coulter, eh, she's kind of getting replaced by Tommy Laren yeah, a little bit. The, there will uh, always be someone in that lane. But there will always be someone in that lane with, who's mm-hmm. blonde and swishing her hair around, right, and spouting fascism. Uh, but if Chris Cuomo is going to ignore that uh, those two people are dragging the White House around by the short hairs over this wall issue, uh, he's missing the story and and not doing his job. I also wanted to bring up uh, something that I know you will like, Drift Glass. Uh, no More Mr. Nice Blog this week did a post <laughs> in which he talked about the wall and how it's polling. I don't know if you saw this or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, the poll by the Pew Research Center, and this is from Axios, Poll by Pew Research Center shows a big part of the reason why the standoff over funding President Trump's border wall has been so impossible to solve. Check out for the both siderism. Republican support for the wall is higher than any time since Trump's election, while Democrat support has dwindled to almost nothing. The big picture, when the divide has gotten this big, it's hard to see how the government shutdown ends. So both sides are extreme mm-hmm. on this issue uh-huh. the thing is if you drill down and look at it there are more democrats in this country than there are republicans and when you look at independents or people who will not claim a party you get to 58 percent of the public opposing the wall 
That's the real number. That's the real number. We're a center-left country. Right. We're a center-left country. Exactly. On immigration, because most people realize right. I'm an immigrant. I come from immigrants. Most people are aware when they go to Oktoberfest that their German heritage <laughs> came from someplace. My Irish heritage is sitting on a kitchen counter right now just waiting re- for me. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So as as No More Mr. Night blog, nice blog, uh, Steve M. wrote, mm-hmm. it's not just that Democrats are representing their base. They're representing the general public. Yeah. Yes. Republicans are representing the Republican base, which is 33 percent. That's yep. it. That's all they've got. Yep. And Ann Coulter's loud mouth. I mean, that's it. Um, well, but here's here's the thing that I think I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. Sure. We've known for years that Republicans don't believe that Democrats are Americans. Yes. We know that only conservatives are portrayed as American in the right wing media and in the mainstream press as well. Every time a reporter makes an anthropological expedition to a rural Pennsylvania diner, they're looking at the real America. That's the real. That's well, that's sister fuck Arkansas. But Mm -hmm. America is not Republican. No, it's not. The point here is that Americans don't want the wall. Democrats are fighting for what America wants. Mm-hmm. And I, that's so brilliant. I, it, it makes me think that as we are watching, and I think we are watching, the collapse of the Trump administration over uh-huh. the course of the next few months. Yeah, yeah. For us to also focus on what we want America to look like. Yes. And start thinking about that and writing it down and <laughs> and adding it to our conversation. Yeah. We want and and we will see that as this <laughs> I think it was Wonkett that said every US senator is now running that said democrat is now running for president. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's Basically, like it does yeah. seem that way. Uh as that conversation goes forward, the the image of what we want America to look like is going to come out and we need to have a language for that. Yeah. So uh, and and we need to assert the fact that we're Americans, all right. of us. Well, uh, and yeah, we right. want we, we want America to be um, smart like Obama and ruthless like LBJ, LBJ and smart and and agile and joyous and uh, uh, exuberant as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Right. That's what we want. Uh, see, we really do believe this is the this is what freaks Republicans out. We actually believe in America. We believe Absolutely. in yep. America, the idea. America is an idea. The Republicans really have collapsed into the core blood and soil, blood and soil, right wing, white nationalist, fascist party that we have been telling you they really were under the hood for decades. This is who they are. They believe America is a it exists geographically as a white Christian conservative empire. It should be walled off from the rest of the world and should rule the rest of the world by force and fear. That's what they believe. Absolutely. And there's really no, there's no way around that. We believe that America is an idea that was first created, first, first encapsulated, first enunciated by the founders who were slaveholding, you know, white men who believe that no one else, but they should have the right to vote and has been perfecting itself ever since. We are in the long line of Martin Luther King. Yep. And they are not. We believe in, in America. Was it, was it Barbara Jordan? Yes. Um, we were listening. We've been listening to uh, Bagman and uh, listening to uh, Slow Burn. I think it was, and, she was on Slow Burn. Yeah. And yeah. it's Barbara Jordan's speech about believing. Her belief in the Constitution is whole, complete. I forget the entire quote and we'll, we'll post it. But it's m- so moving. When you hear someone who knows and says clearly, the Constitution was not written with me in mind, but it's mine, and I believe in it, and I believe it completely, and I believe in fighting for it. And that's really what liberals believe in. That's the one thing that shares that we all share. I think, for example, um, Bernie Sanders has won the idea war. Yes, right. Because it's not just – it's not just America thinks that the wall is a stupid idea. America thinks taxes for the rich are too goddamn low, way too low. And they think health care is a human right. Yes, and college should be affordable, right. and we should have clean air and clean water. All the things that liberals believe in and have been fighting for under various labels in, in on various timelines are things that are now pretty commonly held beliefs in the United States. And every time Republicans step up to the microphone, they're trying to take something away from that group. 
And it's getting, and that group, that majority is getting angrier and angrier that these bigoted idiots keep trying to take their country away from them under various guises. They, they're waving a flag or waving a Bible or whatever it might be. And I do want to go back briefly to Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram. Okay. Because right now, what the mainstream media and what the uh, Never Trump, David Brooks, David Frum, Michael Gerson, conserv- the serious conservatives are trying to do by both sidering everything is repeating on a grand national scale exactly the same mistake they made 30 years ago. They, if I may quote Clemenza from Godfather One, <laughs> you know, you got to stop at the beginning. Like they should have stopped Hitler at Munich. They should never have let them get away with that. They were just asking for big trouble. They let those people, the smart conservatives, the the, sh- the savvy conservatives, the weekly standard conservatives, the intellectual, the serious, let Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram and the rest of that filth get away with murder for decades. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They let them do it. They wouldn't challenge them. They wouldn't confront them. They wouldn't call them out in public. They wouldn't do everything in their power to stop them. And because they are basically cowards who hid in Washington and pretended those people didn't exist, those people took over their party. Yep. And now they're saying, you know what liberals should do? You know what Democrats should do? Exactly what fucking we did, which is give them what they want and let's move on. No, let's not give them what they want. Let's stop them here. Let's stop them here and now so they don't destroy the country. And the people who capitulated to them and bowed to them and begged them and ignored them and played footstool to them and waved their hand at them and told us liberals that this was just a fringe we didn't have to worry about are now telling us how to deal with a monster they created? No, 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 no. You built this. Now we're going to have to fix it. And this time, you don't get to tell us how we fix it. You don't get to decide for us how we get mad, how we get even, right. how we level the playing field. You're not part of this conversation anymore. You're part of the problem. And you're part of that which must be swept away so that we can rebuild this country as it should have been built right from the start. And I'm noticing a lot of unforgiveness on Twitter that we're just yeah. not going to tolerate another no. rebuilding. And we're going to get into that in a minute. But what yes, you said are. about this whole Beltway narrative uh, dovetails very nicely into what happened this week on Nicole Wallace's show. Yes, which which a, a really good write up was on at this blog called Crooks and Crooks Liars. And Liars. I don't know if There's an this. editor there named uh, Francis Langham who did a yeah, she's amazing. She's, <laughs> she's amazing. She, she did a great post you know on she's, this. You know if she's single and if she's available. I don't no, know. She's she's no, she's not. She's married. Very very happily married. Why are all the good ones married, blue gal? <laughs> You're lucky. <laughs> That's why I am uh, crazy lucky. And I mentioned at the very beginning of this post that. Uh, Watching Deadline White House this week was a little bit like listening to this podcast called The Professional Left. Yeah, from 2010. Uh, from 2000. I didn't say that. I wasn't yeah, that nasty, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but I did want to applaud everyone in this conversation. Nicole Wallace, Donna Edwards, uh, Elise Jordan, Richard yeah. Stengel, and Matt Miller were all on the set talking about uh, w- Steve King. How mm-hmm. is it that Steve King got to where he is? How did we get here with this racism? And now the Republican Party is removing uh, some uh, all of his committee seats. He's lost all of his committee seats. Uh, the newspapers in Iowa are calling for him to resign. He has a primary challenger who is a state senator, I believe, in Iowa, and mm-hmm. both the Repub- the new Republican governor, who is a woman of Iowa, and the state Republican Party of Iowa are remaining neutral in the primary of Steve King because they yeah. basically want him to lose. They want this spot I, off of their party. One brief aside. Yeah. Uh, both my siblings were born in Iowa. Uh-huh. And I was mayor of a city in Iowa. You were for, for a uh, day, one right? Day. Yeah. Yeah. For the <laughs> smallest city you've ever seen. But- Anyway, I have, I have roots in Iowa. Yes, I yes. was. I was. Uh, so this conversation uh, was about Steve King and how did we get here? Mm-hmm. And Richard Stengel was the one who said, um, I think what's so upsetting about the Steve King thing is not even so much what he has said, as odious as it is, but it gives a window into the voters of the Republican Party. And the people who have supported him and condoned him all this time. Oh, no. We're talking about the base. We're talking oh, no. about the base. Uh, uh-huh. 
the problem is there are voters who are thinking that within yes. the Republican Party. Those people have nowhere else to go, and they have a president who seems to endorse those views, mm -hmm. which are un-American. Yes, they are. Then, uh, God bless Nicole Wallace. She, these words that she said, get yeah. her in the room. We, we are yep. now accepting her. I mean, she may fall off the wagon, but right. this is how, as a never-Trumper, you get welcomed by the professional left, okay? Right. Part of the problem is we think this does not have a parallel on the left. There just, it doesn't. There isn't. There isn't a strain of racism on the left. And then she says, I, I think this is, this is deeper than she even thought at the time. Yeah. She said, yeah. I, I don't, th so I don't, and then she paused. I think this gets brushed under the rug. People sort of tolerate. It's been normalized. Just like you said, they don't have anywhere else to go, so they attach to the Republican Party. But the Republican Party doesn't have to let them. And I think the deep part is, is the reason it gets brushed under the rug is you can't both cider it. Right. So we won't talk about it. Exactly the same reason we won't talk about Rush Limbaugh. You can't, there is no Rush Limbaugh on the, on the left. So mm -hmm. because you can't make uh, pancakes and pretend that mm -hmm. none of this is happening, and you you have to you actually have to take a stand and blame the Republican Party for the racism in America. Mm -hmm. It gets brushed under the rug in the media. Um, well, and, so I did. I posted about this at Crooks and Liars. You, there's a video of it. It's well worth watching. And it mm -hmm. is how you talk about racism and Republicans. You have to blame the vote. The reason racism is mouthed off by steve king is because republican voters like it well I, I and this is something that i wrote i don't know 15 years ago well 14 years ago um 12 mm -hmm. years ago many years ago when i was a commenter at the steve Gilliard blog if you got rid of all the racists in the republican party you'd have nothing but half a dozen guys in ugly pants arguing about marginal tax rates yep you'd have the california republican party living in orange county in their nice houses wondering about the market yeah that's yeah. it and and this is why the fight over the line is so important mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the line that you see repeated and you can see, this is the next battle it's the next one that's coming and it's the one that never trumpers the rick wilson's of the world are fighting like hell to say all of the bad things started two years ago mm -hmm. yep before that Trumpism. we didn't know about it we didn't know about it. We didn't see it. We had no idea. It was a complete mystery to us that suddenly Donald Trump sh shockingly hypnotized all these good Americans into, into a bunch of mouth-breathing, race, toothless racists. And the same people um, who were in charge of pandering to these people, because here's the difference. If you're arguing you know, in a philosophy class uh, over schools of thought, there's no camp that is funding one side of the argument or the other to win some election. But in the real world, in our world, in the world of electoral politics, without the bigots and the gun nuts and the right-wing Christian evangelicals, Republicans never, ever win another election ever. Right. So if you are a Republican and you would like to win an election so you can get tax cuts for your wealthy benefactors, you have to make those people love you and be part of you, and think of you as their champion. And you have to understand them well enough to make them come to the polls and vote for you. So all the people who were in charge of whipping up the idiots, whipping up the bigots, and pointing them at the polls, like Rick Wilson, decade after decade, damn well knew who these people were. They had to know. You don't go advertising, I don't know, condoms in a convent. It's just it's it's just bad policy. You just it, it, it's pointless to try to advocate for meat eating at a vegan restaurant. The market isn't there, so you have to know who your customers are. You had to know, and this is something that advertising companies and poll takers and Frank Luntz's and focus groups know down to the ninth significant digit. They knew exactly who these people are and exactly how to appeal to them. They knew they were racist. They knew they were idiots. They knew they listened to Rush Limbaugh all day long. They knew they loved Sean Hannity. They know what where their anger and their rage and their paranoia and the Reagan era blame the government uh, um, unhingedness is inside these people. And they fed it and they fed it and they harvested it decade after decade. And now comes Trump. 
a better con man than they ever had, who steals these people away from them and makes himself president thereby. Right. And what do they do? We had no idea these people were ugly. We had no idea they were crazy. We had no idea they were racist. It all started two years ago. I wash my hands of it. I'm innocent. I'm clean. No, you're not. You're complicit. You're part of the criminal enterprise that created this this monstrosity. And the only way you get into our good graces, the only I, there are a lot of credulous liberals out there with much bigger platforms than us mm-hmm. who are perfectly willing to forgive anybody like a drunk prom date who makes the slightest gesture in the direction of, you know, maybe uh, the Republican Party is having problems. No, not here. Yep. You have to go through a certain number of steps, like admitting the history happened, the past occurred, and you were part of it, and you did it in full knowledge of what you were doing, because, and you went along with it because you never thought you'd get caught. And you didn't suddenly have a come to Jesus moment because Jesus came to you and tapped you on the shoulder. <laughs> you came to Jesus because the monster we told you was always coming finally arrived before you could cash your check and get out of the way. Yep. And now you're stuck with it. And here's the thing. Steve King. I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of a sin eater. A sin eater is a, I'm looking it up on Wikipedia now. It's a, it's a, a sin eater is a person who consumes a ritual meal in order to magically take on the sins of a person or household. Mm-hmm. And so the Steve King is their scapegoat. Yeah. Yep. Steve King is, see, Steve King is their sort of a- anti Jesus. You know, he's the bad man over there. He's the bad man. He's the guy who did all the bad things. Look at that bad man over there. Let's rebuke the bad man. Let's look at that racist over there. How did he get in the house? Well, you built the house to accommodate people like that. Yep. You help. You asked him for help on every inch of the way. And all he wants to do is sit in the corner and be a racist. And up until five minutes ago, that was perfectly okay with you. And now it's not. Now you're going to pretend you had nothing to do well, with it. Well, and Drift Class, uh, Matt Miller, in the same conversation with Nicole Wallace, mm-hmm. uh, was asked, how do the Republicans sort of get back to doing something decent? Mm-hmm. And Matt Miller said they'd have to completely reinvent their party. Yeah. And 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 then he mentioned the Congress and Steve King in exactly the way you did. He said, look, they did not have a road to Damascus conversion over the last <laughs> couple of days and decide they were finally going to hold Steve King accountable. He says that stuff all the time in the Iowa papers. His mistake was doing it in the New York Times. Right. And so all of a sudden, the East Coast establishment notices Steve King again. Con- the other thing that happened is control of the House changed and Democrats were going to sanction him on the floor of the House. If Kevin McCarthy was speaker or Paul Ryan was speaker, they would not be sanctioning Steve King. His mm-hmm. comments would have passed the same way his previous comments happened. There'd be no action at all. The problem for the Republican Party is this is now the message of the party. Not usually as explicit as Steve King. They don't come out and just endorse white supremacy. (laughs) But their closing argument to voters in the 2018 midterms, it wasn't just the argument Donald Trump was making. It was Republican House and Senate candidates all across the country. They were talking about that caravan of brown people who were charging Mm -hmm. the southern border. They're Mm -hmm. coming across to take your jobs and threaten your children. Mm -hmm. This is the message of the Republican Party now. Until they come up with a different message, you're going to see racist things and what they symbolize. Mm -hmm. The wall is not a literal wall. The wall is keeping out those people that get in the way of white nationalists. And and every uh, there are probably at least a handful of people inside the Republican Party who would like an off ramp. I'm not saying that they have a conscience, because if you're a Republican now, you're inherently a bad person. But. (laughs) Um, just for sheer like survival stakes, they would like to find a way to not be in the crazy bus with the crazy man at behind the wheel. The problem is every time they look at an off ramp for any other issue, I mean, criminal justice reform is probably one that, you know, everybody can get behind, but you can't, that's, that's a one off mm-hmm. um, infrastructure. Another yeah. one. Yeah. But every other issue about things that the majority of Americans want, which is like clean air, clean water, Good college education, affordable prices, a a living wage, um, higher taxes, all those other issues are in the uh, Democratic platform, right. They're in the Democratic camp. And so anybody who makes any gesture, because remember, the greatest sin you can commit, according to Rush Limbaugh in 1994, the greatest sin you can commit as a Republican is to attempt to compromise in any way with Democrats because right. they're monsters and they hate you and the media's out to get you. So any gesture to bipartisanship on any issue that people actually care about, you will find 
on that off ramp, Rush Limbaugh waiting with a machete to take your fucking head off. Mm -hmm. Well, there is one other off ramp. Uh, You can resign from Congress. That's what Tom Marino did this week. He spent two whole Scaramucci's since his last election. uh, Noticed that he was in the minority and that there's an ethics committee there. uh, And uh, he turned right around and quit. Yeah. (laughs) Two Really, he lasted two Scaramucci's in the new Mm -hmm. house as a minority. And Mm -hmm. uh, he's going to join the private sector, Drift Glass. (laughs) Bye-bye. You know who didn't quit when they were in the minority? Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi. Yep. Yep. Uh, we have to get to uh, this tweet by Matthew Iglesias. He's, he's yes. a guy in the blogosphere out there, I understand. He's got a blue check, I believe. Yeah. He's got a blue yeah. check, yeah. And like yeah. a lot of women bloggers who uh, speak to equal audiences, let me just say. Who don't have um, blue checks next to their name. Don't have so. blue checks because, you no. you know, you got that vaginas in the wave of that, you know. Well, what you need to do is get on the uh, Vox podcast with... Uh, <laughs> With uh, Ezra Klein uh, <laughs> yeah, every week. The then, vaginas don't work so good over there and getting the yeah. door open either. So well, uh, uh, I, anyway, okay. uh, but this was a good tweet and uh, you and I talked about it. And I I think, uh, again, this is a place where professional left podcast zeitgeist is sort of leaking out into the air. We, we've been here. Yes. Uh, Matthew Iglesias tweets. When all this is said and done, it's going to take the Republican Party two to six years to bounce back from being completely discredited. Yep. And a yep. whole bunch of 294 responses so far saying, really, that long? The yep. media will totally uh, be totally complicit. Oh, yeah. No, no. With uh, bringing them back and making sure that both sides, you know, up the upbeat Republican comeback articles will appear in the New York Times. Mm-hmm. David Brooks will be. <laughs> making sure he's got he's got the revival of the Republican Party. Yes, good days are ahead. Just to, don't ignore everything that's happened. Don't look in the rearview mirror. It's full of bodies and evidence and yep. shit like that. Don't look at there. Yep. Trump wasn't a real conservative. <laughs> no, no I, I, I just couldn't. I couldn't take the tweets no more. Blue. No, Cow. I know. You, know, you, you were scrolling down and you just went. I have to turn this off. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and here's the thing. This is what we predicted in 2000. Eight, yeah, and I wrote an article about you wrote Bush belly sneeches for the Bush I administration. Did. I wrote, I "Don't you dare call it Trumpism." Before he was elected, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's gotten he had more Republican base primary votes than any other Republican candidate in history mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. he tapped into low information voters who had seen him on The Apprentice and thought he's a businessman, not a politician. I'm going to vote, yeah. and the racists. Came out in full force for him. And, and the same people who made it a cottage industry on network television, mm-hmm. on, on on legitimate broadcast television to invent a, a completely fake creature named Paul Ryan out of whole cloth. Right. And to rehabilitate Newt Gingrich's career over and over and over again. Uh, and never criticize him, never mention what he does on in his off hours, which is monstrous. Just keep bringing this grifting racist scumbag back on the air dusting them off and propping them up and treating them like a, a jolly old uncle, the same media that is dedicated. And, and uh, this reminds me of when I used to play Monopoly when I was a kid with my brother. And I was good at Monopoly and I would win. And I kept, I kept wanting to play some more. So before crushing him, I would say, ah, here's some more money. Mm-hmm. Let's keep playing. And that's what the media is stuck on. Yeah. They can't, Imagine a world that doesn't have Republicans in it who are actually more influential and more important to their lives than Democrats and liberals on our stupid issues. They can't imagine it. So they have to keep propping up the crazy party. So they'll have some so they'll have a horse race to talk about. And and Republicans know this. So it doesn't matter how crazy they are or how, how offensive they are, or how racist they are, or how destructive their policies are. They know they can count on Chuck Todd propping up their leaders and treating them with respect, putting them on a table where they're co-equal with people who aren't crazy and aren't racist and saying, you know, really, let's all get along. Let's all be bipartisan. And that's the problem. It's not the Republican Party that's the problem. I mean, they're horrible. The problem are the people who keep dragging them back from the ash heap of history and putting them in a chair and saying, no, you get to keep doing this. We're going to keep treating you for the benefit of our our millions of people that watch us. We're going to lie to those people and tell them that you're not crazy. We're going to tell them that you're not nuts. You're not racist. You're not wrecking the country. We're going to keep rehabilitating you forever. And so whatever the fuck you do, 
don't worry, we'll help you cover it up because our job depends on there being two parties that we can blame for everything and never letting liberals, ever letting liberals ahead, never letting them win. And until that dynamic is shattered forever, or at least for a good 10 years, every 18 months or so, every six months or so, the Republican Party is going to just shit the bed, <laughs> fall out of favor, memory wipe, memory hole, um, <laughs> men in black, memory zapper. Suddenly, again, the, the, as you said, the, the triumphant return of the reformed party, and we're going to get David Brooks's column. David Brooks is writing in 2014 that the Republican Party has turned the corner. Right. Um, you know, they're, they're brand new. It used to be this Sarah Palin party. They, people scared people. But don't worry. They're back. They're, they're a normal, sensible party now. We can look forward to good things from these crazy people. And he's going to just be there forever until, until the people that run the paper just, you know, until he just keels over in his office. I don't think he actually goes to his office. But until he, they take him out toes up, that's the story the New York Times is going to stick to. And we have to have a loud megaphone pushing a an honest, correct, clear, concise counter narrative enough to make them uncomfortable, enough to make them actually report the news every now and then. And that's what the Women's March did. And that's what the Black Lives Matter movement did. And that's what the Me Too movement did. It made a big enough noise. These people had to get off their asses and out of their offices and out in the streets and see what people were really talking about. And that's when things right. change. Right. We're going to talk about the Women's March for just a minute. Uh, there's a very good op-ed in the New York Times by Michelle Goldberg, who I love, mm -hmm. uh, talking about the Women's March and the controversies that have surrounded it this year uh, with charges of anti-Semitism and uh, a sense of having lost their way. And that's, again, this both siderist narrative of Dems in disarray, liberals in disarray is a big thing. Uh, but M Michelle Goldberg points out that uh, in the world of digital organizing, uh, people are often left trying to create a movement after a high profile action rather than before it. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened with the Women's March. It caught fire on social media. Hundreds of thousands of people uh, protested Donald Trump the day after his inauguration. And uh, it was a moment, not a movement. And I, I have a similar uh, experience with this in the past with Kent State. <laughs> uh, my dad taught, yes. my grandfather yeah. and my dad taught at Kent State uh, for many years. Wait a minute. And are you a faculty? Are you a faculty brat? I'm a faculty brat of Kent State University. Yes, wow. I am. I knew I loved you for some reason. Uh huh. And uh, as some people may not. No. Uh, May 4th, 1970, there was a anti-Vietnam War protest on campus. Uh, the National Guard was called out to somehow quell the violence of whatever violence appeared to be there. Uh, there were armed National Guard troops who shot four students and maimed others. Uh, and uh, after that event, which was national news for a very long time, because it was Ohio college students being killed on campus, not at in the war. Uh, there were commemorative events every May 4th after that. My parents, being good liberals, took us as kids uh, to these uh, commemorations that were on campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the first two to three years, it was a really somber, sad uh, event, just just a mourning of the death of these students that so many people on campus knew and uh, what had happened. And even though the war was over, uh, every May 4th, you'd get together and you'd remember what happened. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it got to be seven years, eight years after May 4th, 1970, and it's May. It's beautiful outside. It's mm -hmm. a, a lovely day most of the time. Nixon is gone. Uh, the war Nixon's is, gone. The war's over. Uh, we have a Democratic president, mm -hmm. and uh, it becomes a picnic. And mm -hmm. people bring their dogs. And uh, yeah, there are speeches, and yeah, they're rah rah, and the liberals and so forth are all out there uh, making a big deal about it. But it's not a big deal anymore because no one on campus who's a student actually knew any of the students who died. Right. Uh, and right. also they were too young to 
for the uh, go to Vietnam draft to be a part of their lives. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it just fizzled out. It was not the same thing. Now, I'm sure in 2020, Mm -hmm. when we have the 50th anniversary of Kent State, it's going to be a big deal to have a huge, you know, gathering and commemoration and so forth on these big, huge anniversaries. Tom but, Brokaw will uh, talk about it, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure they'll, they'll dig out whoever is old enough to remember uh, who's not a liberal podcaster. Yep. <laughs> they'll, was, they'll get those folks out there, right? It was a troubled time, and there were people on both sides who were <laughs> deeply... <laughs> both sides, equally mm-hmm. bad, right. Mm-hmm. And so it did, it, the, the event did peter out. The, the commemoration did end from what it was in 71, 72, 73. And so to me... Looking at the Women's March, uh, it was never about a core group of New York City, well-connected, intersectional feminists forming a corporation. What? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's not what it's about. Okay. Uh, and and I realize that there are people within that organization who certain candidates on the left don't want to associate with their views. Right. Totally understandable. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that does, that's not why I marched. Right. I don't know those people. I'm Mm -hmm. not familiar with those people unless I see them on NBC or MSNBC. Uh, I'm not familiar with what their individual stands are generally. Mm -hmm. And I really don't care. I'm protesting the Muslim ban. I'm protesting the entire Trump administration. I'm protesting, uh, me, the me too, uh, situation. I'm, protesting for black lives matter i'm protesting for a sane and i want a sane immigration policy and you know what here's the thing none of those people around you who are at those marches or around us i I went to those marches with you and and our kids went to a few of those with us Mm -hmm. none of the people here in springfield were marching for the benefit or the political agendas of those people in new york either right they were right. marching for their own reasons, which were very specific to the offenses that they had seen. The Charlottesville marches here were very specific. They had the city passed a resolution, a largely toothless one, but it's remarkable that the city did anything because it. Oh, absolutely. Because they're living, they're like living in 1971, some yeah. of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but they made a, a significant impact. They helped organize. And this is this is this is the outcome of that. Mm-hmm, it right. helped politically activate people in the community who then went on to register voters. Yeah. Or run for office themselves. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Cause you do, you do have to attach whatever your movement is. You have to, you know, this is going to sound a little goofy, institutionalize it. Right. You have to have a building. You have to have a brick and mortar thing. That's going to last beyond, you know, your energies of the moment that you have. Well, and a, you have to have someone who declares officially that this Saturday is the March. Exactly. And, and not 15 marches going on through the course of six weeks. Right. That the official march, the one that we're all going to, is mm-hmm. this one. Yeah. Beyond that, you don't need a lot of organization for getting passionate people to gather and protest right. these days like, well, because, like Sierra, of, because of the Internet. Right. Like the Sierra Club here. Mm-hmm. It, it, there, there aren't 50 people in Springfield who were who involved in the Sierra Club. There are just a few of them uh, who we know pretty well. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, we do. But they, but they organize very well. They were organized very efficiently, and they get their people out, and they know who their their players are, and they have enough staff to do things. So they they are institutionally here, right? Uh, and they, but they are also feel a, an incredible sense of obligation to attach themselves and and join up with other movements that are moving in the same direction, and that's how you get that synchronized synchronized strength across multiple movements. And and when that happens, you're going to have people who are you suddenly are next to someone that you wouldn't ordinarily be around, uh, but you're all marching for a you know fifteen dollar minimum wage or whatever right. it might be, or you don't like babies in cages and you right. don't want a wall and exactly. you want a sane immigration policy, and so you're standing next to people who absolutely may have different feelings about Turkey or the Middle East or Brexit or whatever. Oh, we all agree mm-hmm. on Brexit. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was a great idea. Great idea. No. <laughs> <laughs> I I want to shout out to Andy in England. Yeah. He and I've been pinging each other all week uh-huh. uh, about uh, Theresa May and UKIP and all the craziness that's going on over there. Well, I believe he told me that we have a center left um, country and they have a centre re left country. 
<laughs> and I was going to say, oh, with your fancy aluminium and vitamins, you got. Anyway, we love it. Years. We do. All we right. love them. All right. Uh, let's do a news roundup. Let's do that. You, you, start? you read the odds. I'll, I'll go with the ads. Last week in the New York Times broke the story that the FBI had launched an investigation into whether Trump is actually an asset of the Kremlin. And Trump's government shutdown continues. Trump says, I don't work for Russia. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say, I don't work with Russia. Right. And when he was asked a direct question from none other than Judge Jean Pirro, he couldn't answer the question. Mm-hmm. And Trump's government shutdown continues. You know, the, the Trump inaugural committee, remember those those guys? Yeah. Uh, they're facing a mere 12 congressional oversight investigations, and the Trump government shutdown continues. Steve King was stripped of all committee assignments because there are Democrats with power watching him mm-hmm. and the Republicans, and Trump's government shutdown continues. Uh, Missouri Republicans demand California co- of their California colleague, go back to Puerto Rico, where he is not from. Wonkett notes that, quote, it is possible Steve King isn't the only racist in the GOP. And Trump's government shutdown continues. I was going to add, and Trump's <laughs> government shutdown continues. Kirsten Gillibrand, Sherrod Brown, Julian Castro, and Kamala Harris uh, all dip their toes into what 10 Grain at Mock Paper Scissors calls the 2020 Goat Rodeo. <laughs> we love him. Not to mention yeah. Tulsi Gabbard. No, literally, not to mention Tulsi yeah. Gabbard ever again. And Trump's government shutdown continues. Uh, Rudy Giuliani pushed Don Jr. under the goalpost moving truck. Collusion is some illusion. I never said the campaign. I didn't do it. It just did Don Sr. who said no. And Trump's government shutdown continues. Then Rudy Giuliani backtracked over his backtrack, collided with himself coming and going, and ripped a hole in the fabric of space time, thus causing the Trump government shutdown to continue even further. Speaking of walkbacks... NBC News initially advised staffers not to refer to Steve King's comments about white supremacy as racist. (sighs) Later, after having been dragged on social media after the email leaked, hmm, I wonder who Mm. leaked it. The NBC Standards Department revised their guidance, goddamn right they did, saying it is fair to describe King's racist remarks as racist. Mm -hmm. Uh, Also, CBS uh, launched their uh, dream team of campaign uh, road reporters, you know, those young, single people who live out of their suitcases. Uh, And there were no black people (laughs) anywhere anywhere to be seen. Uh, Uh And uh, shout out to Auntie Maxine. She got in touch with CBS (laughs) and she fixed that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Maxine Waters. Called him up and fixed that. All right. I feel like I feel like we're missing something. I can't quite put my finger on it. <laughs> she, no, you, she put no, her you finger can't. right on it. Let me tell uh-huh. you. All right. Number nine. Federal workers furloughed because of Trump's government shutdown might be, quote, better off after they return to work because they're essentially getting a free vacation. White House economic advisor and general asshole who's never been out of work, Kevin Hassett, said this week, and Trump's government shutdown continues. The cover of The Atlantic this month is Impeach Donald Trump, Mm -hmm. and Trump's government shutdown continues. Mitch McConnell blocked another bill to reopen the government because this is Mitch McConnell's fault just as much as Donald Trump's, and Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell's government shutdown continues. The White House canceled its planned trip to the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, because everyone there hates Trump and would be laughing at him behind his back or into his face the entire time. Yeah. And Trump's government shutdown continues. A scam artist named Brian Colfage, if that really is his name, finally owned up to what we knew from the start. He never intended for that money to go for a wall. It was just a way to build his email list for future fundraising or scams. Just like Trump 2020. No word on who gets the interest on the millions and millions of dollars they raised. And Trump's government shutdown continues. Nancy Pelosi indefinitely postponed the State of the Union over security concerns during the shutdown. So Trump tried to have her killed. (laughs) He uh, canceled her military plane to Afghanistan, and then he leaked the commercial flight information for members of Congress flying to Afghanistan anyway. Mm -hmm. Nancy then called Trump inexperienced. P.S. She's not tired of winning. Yeah. And Trump's government shutdown continues. 
You, you, like it's just like Hitler at Munich. You got to sh- stop this thing right at the start, right at or the it gets start. out of hand. Yeah, they're just asking for trouble. Meanwhile, the First Lady of the United States flies at taxpayer expense to her luxury resort for a holiday weekend during the Trump shutdown on a government plane. She really doesn't care. So do you? And Lindsey Graham flies to Turkey, and no one at the White House says boo. And Trump's government shutdown continues. Amy Klobuchar is a badass at the bar hearings. She mm-hmm. sure was. Cory Booker was also a badass at the bar hearings. And Trump's government shutdown continues. One thing that won't uh, stop be stopped by the government shutdown is a giant space cylinder called Omu Amu Ah heading this way. It's about half a mile long. So everybody get a copy of Rendezvous with Rama and read it very quickly. Michael Cohen rigged online polls in 2016 with Jerry Falwell's help. Yeah. And Trump's government shutdown continues. Yeah. I don't care that he rigged um, um, a Drudge poll, but I bet the Drudge readers do. Yeah. I bet they don't like feeling like they were look, they made were made to look stupid in front of the libtards because they hate that. Uh, so, you know, just so many rakes stepped onto by so many stupid people. Trump was reportedly startled and caught off guard that Barr had a warm relationship with Mueller. Trump complained to his aides that he didn't realize Barr and Mueller have worked together for 30 years because, you know, nobody fucking checked. And Trump's government shutdown continues. Mike Pence called criticism of his wife's decision to teach at a wingnut, bigot, anti-LGBT Christian school deeply offensive. And I don't know if you saw the tweet that I retweeted this morning uh, saying that maybe Pence and his wife should have electroshock therapy until they don't feel that way anymore <laughs> conversion therapy conversion just we call therapy. it conversion therapy because yep. yep. it's for your own good it's really for your own good just mm-hmm. bite down on this it'll bite be down over on this and bit. then you won't be deeply mm-hmm. offended yeah 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 uh and trump's government shutdown continues in devin nunez news which is really hard to say but we thought we were done with this guy nope mueller and the federal prosecutors in manhattan are looking at a meeting involving devin you know him Michael Flynn and dozens of foreign officials at the Trump and International Hotel in Washington, D.C., two days before Trump's inauguration. And that darn government shutdown caused by Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell just keeps on going. It continues. Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez plays Where's Mitch on social media. And so now longer term House Democrats are asking her to teach them social media, too. <laughs> Show me the Google. Okay. Yeah, they show us how to use the Twitter, and she's going to uh-huh. do it. She's going to hold some seminars. And Trump's government shutdown continues, but no one can find Mitch McConnell to ask him why. Uh, AOC is going to hold seminars for her fellow Democrats on how to do the whole Instagram thing. I wish I that's, could be there. That's so genius. And and what she's doing, and I'm not the first person to notice this or say this, is she is demystifying what's going on in Congress. She's bringing... A really smart outsider. Oh, this is how things work, sensibility, and telling people this isn't rocket science. This is how this institution operates. And I'm going to tell you step by step what goes on here. Right. And I and, think it's incredibly valuable. And if she hadn't done that, we wouldn't have had a segment on Lawrence O'Donnell about all of the different hidey holes where Mitch McConnell mm-hmm. might be hiding. That he has an office here, he has an office there, he has a closet with no sign on it where he can go and talk to people off of the Senate floor. And as the House Majority Leader, he has all of these places that are perks of the office where Mm -hmm. he can do business. And uh, so when uh, Cortez went, you know, on the uh, shuttle train uh, across to the Senate and back again, uh, you got to see behind the scenes. And that's terrific. So uh, but Trump's government shutdown continues. Uh, Stephen Miller was drafting Trump's State of the Union address with special attention to blaming Democrats for the shutdown. God damn you, Nancy Pelosi. She ruined the White House plan to use the State of the Union as a Stephen Miller pen diatribe against the Democrats. How will the Trump Corporation fundraise for Trump 2020 now? And the Trump government shutdown just continues. Everything is a grift. And as long as if you just hold that in your thought while Mm -hmm. you're watching the news, Everything Donald Trump is doing is to gather names for a mailing list for fundraisers, either to sell it or to raise more money from the rubes Mm -hmm. and to consolidate wealth for his company. And as long as you're, oh, everything's a grift, you can Mm -hmm. understand things a lot better. It calms things down to just realize he's just in it for the money. 
Mm -hmm. A federal judge blocked Wisconsin GOP's cuts to early voting. U.S. District Judge James Patterson, oh, Peterson, excuse me, James Peterson said the case for blocking the new restrictions wasn't even close. Yeah, James Patterson is the guy who writes books that you can find that in we can Walgreens. find all over the bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> We've been to used bookstores looking for an yeah. author whose name began with, with P and realized yeah. we could take 15 James Patterson books home instead, right? Yeah, I'm looking for George Pelicano's books. And found one in one used bookstore, one place, and one hardback, another place. And but if you want James Patterson, man, you can build a tree fort with these uh -huh. things. They're everywhere. Uh -huh. uh, for one hot minute on Fox, Benghazi was back because Judicial Watch is still suing about it and won around. Susan Rice and Ben Rhodes have to answer questions in writing about Benghazi, and Trump's government shutdown continues. The Yes Men issued the unprecedented issue of a <laughs> fake Washington Post and distributed it on the streets of D.C. this week. The Washington Post expressed outrage at the use of their copyrighted header font. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Trump's government shutdown continues. In the midst of his government shutdown and impending accountability, Trump sends anti-immigration tweets something to do with prayer rugs at the border, which makes total sense once another tweeter pointed out that he must have been talking not about actual evidence, but about a half remembered plot of Sicario 2. Yep. That's what that's where he got it was Sicario 2. Who knew? What he found what he found were a couple of serapes in the desert. You know. <laughs> these are clear evidence that, that Muslim ISIS, terrorists are ISIS are sneaking in. We defeated ISIS, sir. Shut up. Oh, shut up. Not today. <laughs> we defeated them yesterday and tomorrow, but I need them today. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Turns out the Trump administration separated thousands more migrant children from their parents at the U.S. border than previously reported. It's possible yep. that the uh, director of Homeland Security lied to Congress about this. It's just possible. Calculated sadism is their policy. They mm -hmm. want and, and you're going to see emails about from Jeff Sessions and Homeland Security, you're gonna, they're going to get those emails. The Congress is going to get those emails and find out she was lying and she's in huge trouble. Mm -hmm. And the Trump government shutdown continues. More than 40,000 immigration court hearings have been canceled. You know why, Blue Gal? Due uh, to the government the shutdown. shutdown continues, yeah. The, the Trump shutdown continues. Uh, the Pentagon has also directed additional funds to extend troop deployment at the U.S.-Mexico border. Not the Coast Guard, mind you. No. Not TSA. No. The fake immigration wall security drama theater they're conducting at your expense at our southern border. And the Trump shutdown continues. And, and the Trump shutdown continues. Trump served over one million hamburgers at his personal expense to Clemson University's football team. They thought he was joking when he said he was going to do that. Uh, I can't fault him for serving fast food to college students, but... The silver trays and candelabras was completely unnecessary. And the look on Lincoln's face over Donald Trump's head was priceless. Oh my God. And oh the my Trump God. government well, shutdown continues. The Trump administration really, really, really wants to lift sanctions against companies controlled by Oleg Deripaska, the Russian oligarch with ties to Paul Manafort. Senate Republicans blocked a Democratic effort to enforce those sanctions uh, despite doing nothing to stop the government shutdown, which continues because Donald Trump. And the Trump government shutdown continues. And uh, the uh, Russian media celebrated Republican senators on the air. Uh, yes, they did. Which is unbelievable. Uh, the Trump administration continues to force thousands of federal workers back to work without pay. Mm hmm. And the Trump government shutdown continues. That's slavery, folks. It is. It is. He thinks he's a pharaoh. Um, ISIS claimed responsibility for an attack that killed at least two US, U.S. troops in northern Syria, where Donald Trump has said ISIS has been completely defeated and the U.S. government shutdown caused by Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell and nobody else continues. And uh, just so you know that uh, Vice President so-called Mike Pence Gave a speech or issued a statement, I believe it was, celebrating the end of ISIS hours after that attack. Yeah, timing. Timing there, Mike. Timing's everything timing. there, Mike. Mm -hmm. Hey, each week we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. 
this week's Internet Kitty is actually an Irish wolfhound in the snow. We thought that was totally appropriate. Her name is Miss Brilliant. And according to the listener who submitted her picture, she is the sweetest Irish wolfhound in known space. She also appears to have no fear of a cold nose as she has clearly stuffed her face into a snowbank or two. Boy, we've had dogs like that. It, did you, was your uh-huh. dog like that when, when you were little? I used to do a terrible thing. I would, I would make a snowball and have her fetch it and throw it into a snowbank. <laughs> and um, uh, that dog would plow uh, the, the, uh, the driveway. Uh, <laughs> just, yep. just doing it. She was, a great, she was a good old dog, and we loved her greatly, and we used to have a ball in the snow. Yep. Those of you out there who are affected by winter weather this weekend, as we are, uh, yep. please take care of yourselves. And uh, you can send your internet kitty to us at our email address, prolefpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you get a hot coffee this weekend uh, to stay warm with all the snow, uh, and you can afford to do that, please buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. And uh, we agreed this afternoon that uh, the key to great podcasting is coffee. <laughs> it is. Podcast greatness awaits you if you follow a few simple rules. Number one, have some coffee. Have some coffee. So don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline and get us some coffee. Approximately one half of 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution. And you can, too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Our PayPal, postal address information, buy us a coffee, which is actually a thing, buy us a coffee. And uh, all the other information on Patreon and everything else is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Oh, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties invented Con Mari by sparking joy every damn day. And the Trump government shutdown continues. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, lovey dovey. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018, DGBG Productions Incorporated.